dedicated to the third part of the Cielo theorem. And that part of the theorem will give us a restriction on the number of Cielo P subgroups that there are. So let's recap the entire situation. You're given a group G, and that group G has order P to the K times M. And here, P is a prime, and M is a number that is relatively prime to P. So we're pulling out the largest factor of P that divides the size of G here. I'm going to let N sub P be the number of Cielo P subgroups. Those are subgroups of G that have size P to the K. Now one of the things we talked about in the first video on the Cielo theorems is that the idea behind them is to find these Cielo P subgroups for different primes P and then piece them together eventually to figure out what's going on with the actual group G. So let's recap some of the things we actually discussed in previous videos. So again, a CLOP subgroup is a subgroup of size P to the K. And one of the things we proved, and we're going to use a lot in part three of the CLO theorems, is part two of the CLO theorems, which states that if H and K are CLOP subgroups, then they're actually related in the following way. H can be represented as a conjugate of K, meaning H is G, K, G inverse for some element G in the group. One of the things that's going to become important in this theorem is the normalizer. I'm going to talk about that when we need it. But let's go back to what the statement of part three of the Cielo theorems is. It states that if n sub p is the number of Cielo p subgroups, then we can actually get a restriction on what n sub p can be. The first restriction is that n sub p has to divide this number m right here. And secondly, n sub p has to be congruent to 1 mod p. So we're going to prove both of these. And we're going to use the approach that we did in the first Cielo theorem and the second Cielo theorem using a group action on a particular set. So we need to define a set and a group action in each of these situations that is going to give us the result that we actually want. And in future videos, we're going to see how these numbers can help us actually understand the structure of G in many cases. So let's go ahead, let's dive in and experiment and see what's going on with each of these situations. Okay, so in the first part of the proof, which is that n sub p divides m, the number of Cielo p subgroups divides this m here, um, the set we're going to work with is the set of Cielo p subgroups. And our action is going to be conjugation. So g is going to act on this set right here, and is going to take any Cielo p subgroup and map it to g p g inverse, that's conjugation. Now the result of this is going to be a Cielo P subgroup. There's a natural bijection between P and GPG inverse by sending any element little p to this G little p little g inverse, the inverse of which, if we have a P prime here, is G inverse P prime G. But what's more important about this action is if you pick any Cielo P subgroup, and look at the entire action of the whole group G on that Cielo P subgroup, it's going to have to be all of the Cielo P subgroups. Let's actually give this set a labeled name, maybe something like omega. Right? Then what we're saying here is that G, the entire group, acting on this one Cielo P subgroup, whichever Cielo P subgroup you pick, is going to be all of omega. And the reason is because of the second Cielo theorem. Any other Cielo P subgroup is going to be a conjugate of this group. And this orbit is the set of all conjugates. So we're going to get everything in this set. OK, but by the orbit stabilizer theorem, the size of G actually equals the size of this orbit times the size of the stabilizer of P under this action. So we're going to investigate the stabilizer in a second. The thing to know here is this is actually the size of omega, the number of Cielo P subgroups, that is what n sub P was defined to be. So this is the number of Cielo P subgroups right over here. So somehow this is going to reveal to us a relationship between n sub P and this number m right here. So maybe we need to look at the size of the stabilizer to get an understanding of what it is. So the stabilizer of our particular Cielo P subgroup that we chose is a set of group elements by its definition, that fix P under this action. Okay, so this is a set of group elements that do this to P. This set here is actually the definition of the normalizer of P in G. We've stated it actually here, if H is a subgroup of G, its normalizer is a set of group elements 
where when you conjugate H, you get H back. So this thing is a subgroup of G. We won't prove that here, but I'll give you some ideas. First of all, the identity is in here because if H is a subgroup, then H is itself. That's what happens when you conjugate by the identity. Similarly, if G H G inverse is H, then multiplying by G inverse on the left and G on the right gives you H is G inverse H G. So if G is in this set, then G inverses is closed under inverses. And you can do a similar thing to see that it's closed under products. All right, so this thing is an actual subgroup of G itself. Furthermore, P is actually a subgroup of this normalizer. Now we're gonna prove that P is actually a normal subgroup of the normalizer a little later, because we'll need that in the second part. So I'll just state that this is true right now. It kind of makes sense if you think about it. If you take any group element in P, then this expression right over here, you can make run through all elements of P itself. First of all, all these elements have to be in P because they're products of things in P, right? And then by multiplying by G inverse on the left and G on the right, you get that this runs through all elements in P. Now we have a sense of something. This thing is the size of the normalizer. So the group is n sub p, the number of CLOP subgroups, times the size of the normalizer of this group, p. Okay, and p itself, capital P, sits inside of here. But capital P has size p to the k. And this g has size p to the k times m. And this group p sits inside of the normalizer, so it's a subgroup of this, it's that means that the normalizer has size p to the k times something else. Maybe we'll call it m prime. Now, as a consequence, if you look at this expression, we have p to the k m is the number of CLO p subgroups times p to the k times m prime. So n sub p, the number of CLO p subgroups, is m over m prime. Or in other words, a divisor of m. So n sub p actually does divide m. So a really nice argument that pieces together an interesting action on the CLOP subgroups and uses the orbit stabilizer theorem in a nice way bringing in the normalizer, recognizing that the normalizer is what the stabilizer of the action is. Okay, great. So now that we've covered that, let's go on to the second part of the statement. So now we want to prove the second part that the number of CLOP subgroups is congruent to 1 mod p. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to have a set and an action that's going to help us. Our set is going to be that same set we had before, the set of all CLO P subgroups, right? So the number of them, the size of omega, is going to be n sub P, the thing that we're interested in figuring out. Okay, and the action, we're going to do the following. We're going to pick a CLO P subgroup specifically, okay? And the subgroup we're going to pick, we're going to call P. And then the action is going to be P, this one CLOP subgroup, on the entire set omega. So the instructions need to take a little p in the group P and a Q being a CLOP subgroup and produce something. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to hit this little p with the Q by making it P, Q, P inverse. Now again, this is a conjugate of Q. So it is actually a CLO P subgroup. Okay, so big P is acting on this entire set omega. I wanna draw a diagram. Let's say omega was right over here, and we'll recall that the size of this group P is a power of a prime. So this splits up into orbits. We have a bunch of orbits, each of which has a CLO P subgroup. So one of these dots is an element of this entire huge set. So it is a CLO P subgroup. Okay. Now, by the orbit stabilizer theorem, these orbit sizes all have to divide P to the K. So they're either one or P or P squared or P cubed, et cetera. But we're interested in looking at what the remainder is for the number of CLO P subgroups when we divide by P and trying to prove that that's actually one. We can ignore for a second all of the orbits that have size a multiple of p, and those choices are sizes p 
p through p to the k, powers of p only, because they have to divide the size of the group p that's acting itself. And so we'll just look at the number of orbits of size 1. If we can prove that the number of orbits of size 1 is 1, then we're happy. So I'll write down here, one thing we know is this n sub p, the number of things in this blob, is the same mod p as the number of size 1 orbits of this action, which I'll write like this, p acting on the CLOP subgroups. So let's count the number of orbits of size 1 and see what we get. Hopefully, this is going to be 1 mod p. Okay, so let's take an element q, and let's suppose q being here a CLOP subgroup, and let's say that the orbit size of this particular thing is 1. So we hit p on all of omega, all these CLOP subgroups, and here, when we do these clumps that all have size multiples of p, there are some that have potentially size 1. Here's q, that's one of them. All right, so the size of this orbit is 1. Okay, what does that mean? That means if we take all of these sets, this is precisely the orbit of q under our action. It's all the outcomes you can get like this. So what we're saying is this thing has size 1. One of the things in here is actually q when you set p to be the identity element. So what we're saying is this entire set actually is just a set consisting of the element q. So as a consequence, we're saying that p, q, p inverse equals q for every single element p in our subgroup p. When we look at all of these statements, this means that the elements of p actually sit inside of the normalizer of q in g. Right? The normalizer of q is the set of group elements that satisfy an equation like this where our h is q, and we have that right over here for all the elements in p. So we're saying here that p then sits inside of the normalizer in the group g of q. And since this is a group, this is actually a subgroup of this. We already know q actually is a subgroup of the normalizer itself already. That's from this statement right over here. So now we have these two groups that are sitting inside of the normalizer of q. Now here's what's interesting about these. These still have size p to the k. And the, this group is actually a subgroup of g. So its size is p to the k times another number. Not necessarily m, it could be smaller, but it is size p to the k times something because it contains in it subgroups of size p to the k. So in fact, p and q are CLO p subgroups of this particular group right here. The reason being is that they're highest power of p subgroups that sit inside of this group right over here. So by the second CLO theorem, because these two are CLO p subgroups of this smaller group than G, these two have to be conjugate when thinking about conjugacy inside of this group. So this means, if we pull this sort of up here, that P itself is GQG inverse for some G in the normalizer of Q. But we additionally know that any group is actually a normal subgroup of its normalizer. We can kind of see why just from the definition of normalizer. The normalizer consists of the elements in the group that when you conjugate h, you get h back. And elements of h itself satisfy that condition. Okay, but then if q is a normal subgroup of this normalizer, then this actual thing right here because q is normal in the normalizer, is actually going to be q itself. So let's look at what we did. We picked an arbitrary element q that is a CLO p subgroup. Looking at this action of this one fixed CLO p subgroup p on the CLO p subgroups themselves, 
we said let's pick q to be an element whose orbit size is 1. And through this analysis, we proved that this q has to be p itself. So in this action of p on the CLO p subgroups, the only one that has orbit size 1 is actually p. Because through this argument, we said if q is one of these orbit 1 CLO p subgroups, then that q has to be p itself. So the number of size 1 orbits under this action actually is exactly 1. Since the number of CLOP subgroups is congruent to this mod P, as we argued before by analyzing the orbit sizes, this means that the number of CLOP subgroups actually is congruent to one mod P. Now, this is probably, in my opinion, the most difficult of all of the pieces of the proof of the CLO theorem. Passing from the group itself into the normalizer and recognizing that you have these two CLO P subgroups in the normalizer itself, then using that to figure out what's going on with the relationship between them is kind of a complicated piece of work. But luckily we were able to manage it. So now we have all the three CLO theorems at hand, which is awesome because it gives us the power now to actually use it to prove interesting classifications of a bunch of groups. So we're gonna do that in the videos to come. I hope you liked today's video. If you did, definitely click the like button. And if you wanna see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel.